Hello, I'm John Gear, and I'm uh, Dean of the College of Arts and Science here at Vanderbilt, and also I'm part of the Unity in American Democracy project. And we are lucky enough today to have uh, Jonathan Martin of the New York Times to uh, have a conversation uh, about his new book, This Will Not Pass, written with uh, Alexander Burns. This is the first of a set of conversations that the Unity Project is uh, sponsoring, our summer conversations, if you will. And uh, this is an ongoing effort by the Unity Project to continue the, the dialogue that's so critical to the, to the country, and certainly something that uh, Jonathan and his colleague have done with the publication of uh, this uh, book. So, so welcome, Jonathan. Well, thanks for having me, John. It's a treat to be here at Vanderbilt and to be back in Nashville. Yeah, well, it's always great to have you. And uh, let's just dive right in. Uh, this is a great book, and I mean that Thank seriously. You. Obviously, you know, I'm a personal fan of yours, but Thanks. this is this is a work that I think we could maybe usefully ground in in a little bit of context in the sense that you're trying to bring to life the, the 2020 election, but also the aftermath yeah. of the 2020 election. And this is very much in the tradition. Maybe it's the next step forward from people like Teddy White, who wrote the making of the president in 1960. Yeah. You have Jules Whitcover mm -hmm. um, writing. You have Dan Balls. You have a series of very prominent yeah. journalists over the years, and and you've kind of taken up that mantle and and adjusted it for the time. And I'd be interested in hearing yeah. your, your thoughts about this book in that broader context. Yeah. Well, I'm a huge fan of the people that you just mentioned, and, and you know, Dan Balls uh, is is a mentor of mine and somebody I really look up to. And of course, I've read all of his books and all of the what. Cover and German books, two people uh, I also got to know uh, over the years, and uh, of course read the seminal Teddy White series as well, John. So our initial idea was more in keeping with that sort of campaign book tradition. Mm -hmm. And when we got this deal with Simon and Schuster in 2020, Alex and I were looking toward what was going to be a really fascinating, potentially historic campaign between Biden and Trump. I think the idea was let's do a really memorable campaign book about a really memorable campaign. Well, the cascade of events that happened over the course of 2020 that everybody watching this can recall, COVID, the George Floyd uh, murder and subsequent protest, uh, the collapse of the economy related to COVID, then, of course, President Trump's refusal to concede the election and his effort to overturn the election culminating on January 6th it became really evident to us that we couldn't do one more campaign book, John, that that was inadequate to the moment, that we had to do something different. And our vision was to do uh, a first draft of history, a history of this moment of crisis in American politics to capture uh, behind the scenes at the top of both political parties how the country's leadership grappled uh, with this period, um, effectively a kind of political stress test of our democracy. And I think that's what we decided to do. So yes, the campaign of 2020 is certainly a part of the book, as is President Trump, but it's more than that. It's, it's, it's Joe Biden's first year in office as well, because we cover 2020 and 2021. And I think we just rejected the idea that you have to separate policy and politics or sort of, uh, you know, people and policy, that it's, it's all part of the same the same stew. And we also just didn't want to do a book, John, on the president or the two candidates and a half dozen of their top staffers. Right. Uh, we want to do something bigger, more expansive, more comprehensive about, yes, the presidency, but also the Congress. And yes, Washington, but also the states and how right. governors and mayors were grappling with this period as well. And that's what I think we, we tried to do here. Yeah, and it, it comes through when you think about all the, the local conversations you had local in the sense that reports from governors and yeah. dealing with COVID responses, right. et cetera, and how Trump was dealing with it. It is a fascinating glimpse into that. The other thing that, you know, at the Unity Project, one of the things we're really touting is we're trying not to be partisan. We want to inject, re-inject, so to speak, evidence into the conversation, right. the national conversation, that if you allow ideology, for example, to drive your decision making, you're going to be wrong about half right. the time. But if you use evidence, you're not going to be right all the time, but you're going to be closer to it. And one of the things that struck me about about this book, in some sense making it uh, more old school than a lot of journalism yeah. this day, is that you have a lot of evidence. You yeah. have you cite, you take real care, and especially you make reference to it in the introduction, where you talk about the role of quotes and right. making sure that you have evidence to back. You're not trying to make claims 
up, you're trying to deal with the, the facts, and that really yeah. is important in these days. We wanted to do a book that was anchored by the reporting and by the sort of shoe leather journalism that we really feel passionately about. Like, we still think that there is a place for objective political journalism. And in some ways, John, it's more essential now than ever. Look, we're, we're in a sea of opinion. And it's that proverbial line about, you know, you're uh, a thirsty man surrounded by an ocean of water that you can't drink. There's no lack of political commentary in this country, Lord knows. Yeah. But what there's not a ton of is, you know, deep, uh, penetrating, and yes, objective reporting inside the two parties, trying to capture the the um, the, the thoughts and the, the actions of uh, our leadership class in America. That doesn't mean that you sort of pull punches. It doesn't mean that, that both sides are equal, that there's sort of this blind kind of both sides, which obviously is sort of the sort of hashtag on Twitter. Look, clearly the Republican Party is in a very different place right now mm -hmm. than Democrats are. They're basically uh, in the grip of a cult of personality, figures, or would-be authoritarian. And that's simply not where Democrats are. Democrats have significant challenges, but they're not equal. And I think we're, we're, we're clear in the book about that. But we also don't want to just do a Jerry made in the book. It's about, uh, you know, sort of tutting. Mm -hmm. we, we want to sort of show, not tell. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the tradition that you're talking about is sort of illuminate uh, rather than singe. And I think that's what we tried to do with reporting uh, from the leadership of both parties. Yeah. And that's, you know, this is where, you know, it's it's so frustrating in this day and age when people just make it up. And it's, it happens on both sides yeah. of the of the aisle. What is your sense of, of the, you know, you're obviously in the press. You've written a book that is speaking to the 2020 election. What's been the reaction of, your fellow journalists to this it's been really positive and i think we have friendships with a, you know, a number of reporters both t television and print um and i think they respect our work and it's gotten very positive reviews from our colleagues and obviously um there's been uh, a lot of news in the book that's gotten covered mm -hmm. and, and, oh, yeah. and, and outlets that are not our own uh namely the the audio tapes uh, of some of these conversations that we report on in the book. So it's been it's been positive. And I think it's hard for either party to say that you're being unduly um, hard on them, given what's in the book. I mean, if, you, if you don't like one chapter, go to the next chapter and you'll find no, right. uh, sort of, you know, similarly tough but fair reporting uh, on the, the other party. Uh, again, it doesn't mean that, that you sort of put them on an equal plane. Um, but I think if Republicans are being honest with themselves or honest for the purposes of, of history in our book, I think they'll concede that they're in a very different and more difficult place than Democrats are because they're sort of living with this Trump challenge now for, for seven years and counting. That's right. And, and it's going to go on for a few more years for sure at minimum. Yeah. Because even, even if he decides not to run, he's going to continue to not tell anybody. Be a major for, actor, absolutely. And, and you don't, you know, he's a major player on the stage. You hardly blame him for that. So, in as you wrote this book, yeah. and you've had reactions or whatever, what, how would you assess the condition of the journalism and the news media today? I'm really worried about our our news media today, and. Less because of the national coverage and more because of state and local yeah. journalism. Look, I, I think there is a robust Washington-based political press corps. If you go to the U.S. Capitol today, it's crawling with reporter. I think that that's not our, our challenge. The challenge we have is that the, the financial model for regional and local journalism is, is, is gone kaput, and there's nothing that has filled uh, that role. And so you do, there's significantly less accountability uh, for uh, state and local uh, politicians. And also, candidly, the, the changes in technology have elevated the national over the regional and the local. And so I think that has accelerated the, the polarization of our politics in this country, and it's made the kind of siloing of red and blue that much easier. Because if you're living in Nashville or Carthage or Cookville or Memphis or wherever else in Tennessee, and you know, you're following public affairs and news, it's mostly via television, 
and the internet. And that's largely national in scope. And for a lot of people, it's national, uh, uh, the red version or the blue version. Right. And that's a departure from politics and political journalism from 30 years ago when the anchor coverage was local. It was your your local paper on the doorstep in the morning and the three affiliates in your, in your city uh, on TV that night. And I think we're in a very different place now in terms of the news flow and what that has meant in terms of people living in their sort of partisan silos. So do you think that you know, there's a lot of hypotheses put forward about why, for example, congressional elections aren't uh, competitive or yeah. state legislative races right. aren't competitive. I mean, it could, it's obviously partly tied to, to gerrymandering. But do you think it's also because the local media just don't have the resources to hold people accountable? And so therefore, you know, politicians get away on both sides of the aisle, get away with things that they wouldn't normally have. I think that part of it, I also think that people are just voting voting nationally for their preferred tribe all the way down the ballot. Uh, look, when you see Donald Trump's face popping up in school board races or county council races, like yeah. I have covering politics, that, that tells you everything about where we okay. are right now. Um, look, I think people, you just, let's just take Nashville for for example, I think if, if if you had a sort of middle class, middle aged couple in Nashville, in an earlier era, uh, they were getting their news from the Tennessean that they would probably get delivered to their house every day, and then watching the affiliates here, and maybe watching the national news, and if they were really engaged, PBS and Time and Newsweek. Mm -hmm. um, now that couple is living on a iPhone or their tablet or their computer and they're getting their information from there, from Facebook, from Twitter, mm -hmm. uh, from Instagram even, and also uh, watching cable. Um, that's how they get information now. And so I think because of that, politics has been nationalized in a way that people vote their tribal preference. And if you're team red or team blue, then that's how you're going to vote because that's what what values you hold and the idea of saying oh well i can vote for a you know democrat for a senator but for a, you know republican for a president it just happens less and less because you're so locked into your preferred uh, yeah. tribe based upon your values. I mean, just you just look here what happened with Phil Bredesen's challenge against Marshall Blackburn in 2018. A pretty good year for Democrats nationally, but there's just not people in this state who were willing to vote for the Democratic Party based upon the their perception of what the Democratic Party is. And it, it doesn't matter that Phil Bredesen yeah. was the banner carrier. They're not voting against Phil Bredesen. They're voting for Team Red and against Team Blue, and it's not much more, more complicated than that. Yeah, that's right. And, and in the case of uh, Governor Bredesen and Senator Blackburn, Bredesen was, was more, had more favorable ratings than Blackburn, but yet it was the party that, you know, that carried the day, and that's why she went to it's a, a very comfortable yeah. way. It's a much more parliamentary system that we're sort of moving toward. And it's a great departure from 20th century American politics, which were much more complex and nuanced and complicated. This is a sort of cleaner red and blue dynamic that perhaps the, the, the poli sci crowd would, would prefer, but obviously for people you know, covering politics, it's, it's uh, far more predictable. If you give me the demographics of a given state or district, I can probably tell you who's gonna win the election. Right. Just yeah. based on that. And by the way, that's a hard thing to grasp, that candidates and events don't matter as much as just tribal preference, but that's where we're kind of going, you know? Yeah, and that's, you know, that, that we see that all over the country, and there's no no debate about that. Just quickly, as you look sure. into the your crystal ball for 2022 in the midterm elections, um, do you see anything that would give Democrats reasons for hope in, for example, the the Senate or the House, I suspect, is uh, in deep yeah, trouble. Yeah, the House is, is much more of a parliamentary up or down, I think, uh, on red or blue. And I think um, there's just not a lot of optimism in Democratic ranks right now. They have a narrow House majority as is. It's hard to see they retain that when President Biden's in the low 40s or high right. 30s. And the House vote is effectively a confidence vote on the party in power. And that means the president in power. Yep. Uh, the Senate's a little different because it does still have a touch of that sort of older dynamic that we were just talking right. about where, you know, candidate performance and candidate 
uh, status does matter somewhat. I think it matters a lot less now than it would have 20, 30 years ago, certainly 40 years ago. But it still does matter. If you have a candidate who's sort of botching uh, a campaign or there's some oppo unearthed on the candidate, that, that can still have an effect. Right. Uh, it just It's sort of harder now. Um, um, because of this world that we're in. And we, we capture this in the book that, you know, people ask us all the time, John, why did the Republican Party row back to Donald Trump? Why did they re-embrace Donald Trump after January 6th? Twice impeached, left office in disgrace. This never would have happened with Richard Nixon. There was never going to be a contingent of congressional Republicans going to San Clemente to kiss the ring when yep. Nixon was driven from office yep. in the mid-'70s. Why so fast? And that tells you everything about this period because the Republican leadership class is basically deferring to the perceived wishes of their voters. And again, we're in this tribal moment where the Republican voters are just aren't that bothered by Donald Trump's conduct. They, yeah. they are much more animated by their opposition to the left. Yeah. And so when McCarthy and McConnell sort of after January 6th for a moment recalibrate and sort of see what the landscape is looking like and maybe it's time we can break from Trump, in pretty short order they realize that their voters are still just fine with Trump. And so for McCarthy, that, that means going to Mar-a-Lago before the month is out in January in 2021 and re-embracing Trump and keeping him close. And for McConnell, it means just closing his mouth and going silent about Trump. Right, yeah. But it's an extraordinary moment of sort of leaders bowing to their voters. Yeah, and it's, you know, this is where democracy, small d democracy can, you know, give people angst because let's say you disagree with that, you, as a politician, right. you can lead at certain points in time, but the other points you have right. to follow. And they made a calculation that they're going to follow because yeah. if they choose to lead, they're putting their yeah. own careers at risk. And this is the dynamic that, you know, I always try to tell, tell my students that, look, I mean, your, your preferred candidate may have lost this right. time, but the realities are that down the road they'll win. And this is what happens. And the public doesn't always do what you we're, want them to do. We're now left with two major political parties in this country that are essentially um, – organized around antipathy toward the opposition, right? Yeah. I mean, we never has uh, you know, negative partisanship in such a powerful animating force in modern American life. Democrats uh, contain everything from actual socialists on the far left to Bush era Republicans on the right. What is the coherent force therein? Animus toward Donald Trump. You take that out of the equation, and what unites AOC and Dick Cheney? Not a whole lot, okay? You look at the Republicans. What 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 is the coherent force then? What what's the, what's their glue? Contempt or fear for the real and perceived excesses of the left. So you have the two parties organized not around a sort of agreed upon agenda or a constructive policy platform, but entirely around a sort of contempt bordering on fear and hate for the other party. Yeah. And that's what we're left today. Yeah. So on that happy note. <laughs> so for So let's think of it this way. You've spent in a sense two years last two years of your life thinking about small D democracy. Yeah. What's what's your What's your hopes and fears for the future? I mean, has this left you more optimistic or less optimistic? I'm pretty pessimistic in the short to medium term. Uh, I think our tribalism is is not going to get better tomorrow. A technology and, and information consumption and the incentive structure for politicians is not going to change tomorrow or next week or next month. I think it's going to lead toward more partisanship. Um, there is a time in this country where crises – uh, could unify the country and sort of bring people together across the lines that divided them. I think COVID demonstrated that that's not going to happen. You know, it had the opposite effect, right? COVID didn't rally the country together. It drew people further apart. And it underscored our partisanship, our, our polarization more than it did transcend it, John. Mm -hmm. We went into our, our, our corners again, a mask, no mask, vaccine, no vaccine. It immediately got caught up in the same partisan wars that shape everything else in public life in this country. So I'm pretty damn pessimistic in the short to medium uh, term. In the longer run, what gives me some hope is the history of this country. You know, our friend John Meacham had a whole book about this. Uh, yep. uh, pl plug for Meacham there, even though I'm here for my own damn book. Um, <laughs> this will not pass. Please buy it today. Uh, <laughs> operators are standing by. Um, no, Meacham's book sort of captured this, that, yep. you know, there's always been this one step forward, two steps back 
uh, arc in American history. We, we, we have sort of uh, made so many wrong choices over the course of history, but we tend to get it right eventually. We tend to keep uh, sort of, you know, reaching for that, that promise uh, of the founding, uh, even though we haven't quite fulfilled it yet. So I think that gives me some hope. Like, we've come through a lot in this country, including a civil war. So I feel like, you know, the long term, there's some optimism, and hopefully young people can sort of learn from the example of their elders and try and get it right. Yeah, well, certainly the we're hoping the next generation comes along and, and ele- elevates the the conversation. So let's just go back to your comment about how COVID, that crisis, could not yeah. have unified the country. Do you think there was a response by President Trump that could have unified? Because his instinct was always to divide. That's how he got elected. Yeah. That's how he governed. And, we, and with great success. We capture this in the book. You know, every president in modern times before Trump, at least rhetorically, John, tried to be the president for all people. They, you know, President Clinton went to Oklahoma City, a red state after the bombing there. President Bush to Manhattan, very much a blue city in a blue state right. after 9-11. Trump never even bothered pretending that he was a yeah. president for all people. He was a president for his coalition. So that didn't necessarily surprise me. Um, could he have changed that with COVID? I think he could have altered the perception on the margins of him. Um, I think that it was tough at that point in his presidency though, to bring people together. I think it would have been very, very That's difficult. And he just didn't have it in him. It's just not who he is. Yeah. Um, um, I, I don't think that one man could have sort of uh, transcended the partisanship and certainly not that man. Mm-hmm. Um, no, I mean, I just, I think like once COVID became a public health issue and people were, were making choices in Washington for the larger population, it was immediately in the hands of, you can't tell me what to do, and this is excessive, or this is not sufficient, right. and um, it was just one more log on the sort of raging fire uh, in our polarized times. And so different from other crises, which um, you know, at least initially tended to unify the country. Right. Yeah, no, that's that's a big change. So. You know, you made the reference to history, and we'll kind of close our conversation on this uh, yeah. This note, is that one of the things we're doing at the Unity Project is to stress the fact that obviously evidence is important and we need to not let ideology guide us, but rather let us go in the direction yes. of evidence. But it's also true Very Herbert Crawley of you. It, well, I, we, we try our best. Um, but the, Probably the first Herbert Crawley reference on this. I, I'm very confident okay. of that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that you know, you've got you've got the role of evidence, but unity does. Our goal in unity is not that everybody agrees because everybody's going to disagree. That's, right. That's not, that, you know what democracy is about is adjudicating those differences, yes. but finding a way to adjudicate them, uh, playing by the same sets of rules, yeah. and that's really what the big you know the big breakdown potentially is because you know Trump didn't want to play in the football field yeah. that had been laid out by the Constitution right. in a That's sense, right. and so. What I worry about and is that that cycle is going to continue because when you don't like an outcome, that's right. You're just going to you're just going to make it up. So go let's go back to 1980. You know, Jimmy Carter did not try to pretend the economy was doing well. Right. Jimmy Carter did not try to pretend the foreign policy was going well. Why? Because he couldn't. Right. But in this day and age, do you think because of the disintegration of the news media, the breakdown of the ideological factions, people's media bubbles, that actually the foundation of accountability and evidence is, is to the point where we're just going to have a, a heck of a time getting yeah. to, to, again, not unity of, of, on policy, but unity about the rules? No, that's what's really alarming about the 2020 precedent is if you can't even agree upon the rules of the country and of democracy. We, we always took a peaceful transfer of power for granted yep. because, of course, whoever lost would eventually do the right thing and concede. And I think Trump broke that, and I he, he obviously doesn't it would be willing to do that again, what he attempted in 2020. And basically, this was down to Mike Pence doing the right thing on January 6th. If Pence doesn't act the way he did on the 6th and resist Trump's pressure, we would have faced a constitutional crisis in this country mm-hmm. leading up to January 20th. No, the lack of shared facts is a really troubling development. If you don't have shared facts in the country, you're not even arguing over the same sort of basis in reality, uh, it's hard for a democracy to work very effectively. Um, and that is really disconcerting, that, that you could have people who sort of 
don't even agree upon the sky being blue. And um, uh, I think the technological developments have made that a lot easier. People can bask in their version of reality. That's right. Uh, and that's, uh, that's disconcerting. I will say, though, that um, an, uh, reality does have a way of intruding. Just ask Joe Biden right now. I mean, people drive past the gas station, and it says $5 a gallon. And that's a shared reality that nobody can deny. No, oh, that's right. Uh, and so I think that you know politicians do face some level of accountability based on facts on the ground, even if um, we are increasingly in these two information silos uh, between the parties. Yeah. Well, with that... Um I'm going to urge everybody to go buy a copy of uh, Jonathan's book. It's, uh, it's worth reading for hundreds of reasons. It is the kind of first draft of history, and it's something that will affect the conversation going forward. And uh, I thank you for your time and for writing the book. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. Yep.